Hi everybody, my name is Samantha Wilkinson from the Office of Instructional Technology. I'm an elementary teacher specialist and today we're going to be talking about unique digital student projects that you can do with your elementary students. So the purpose of this PD is to kind of give you some inspiration for the end of the year. Uh, as we know, there's only a couple of months left. We're in our last marking period and it might be that you and even your students are getting tired of the same old project ideas and are ready for something new. It's also a great time of year to start something new because typically there's a little more flexibility in this last marking period to take some risks. And now that you've built this great community in your classroom to try some new applications. The standards that we're going to hit are on the screen here. Uh, the ISD teacher standard, we're hitting 2.5, the designer standard. And our students would be hitting on digital learning standard six, where they are communicating and expressing themselves using digital media. So the agenda for today is that we're going to start with our paper to, paper to digital resource, which is where you can digitize any project based on instructional cards. We're then going to talk about Nearpod, how it's actually a, a, a platform for students to create gamified presentations as well as teachers now. We're then going to head over to WeVideo and look at some of their templated video options. We're also going to jump into Adobe Express, our newest application, and see some of the cool things that you can make over there. We're going to touch on Minecraft, which is not just for gaming, but there's some great opportunities for students to learn within that application, but also to create products. And then we're going to go over some help resources for all of these different platforms. So starting with paper to digital, uh, this website was created by the Office of Instructional Technology with the idea that there are so many projects that people do in their classrooms that are traditionally paper pencil and now we can digitize those to really expand our accessibility options and to give students a lot of different ways to express themselves. So to get to our paper to digital resource, you're going to head over to your class link page and we're hitting that orange folder, the instructional tech resources folder. There are five apps in here. We're going to be hitting on the paper to digital, the last one. And you'll see it'll open up in a new screen. This website, as I said, was created uh, with the idea that we wanted to give platform instructions for all of our applications uh, for any project that you can think of. So going across the top, we have our projects that you can search by. You can also search by application. So if you already know you want to do something in Padlet or Nearpod, you can go to those places and it will show you all of the projects. Discovery Education Board Builder, we have different projects that match up with the board builder. So maybe you traditionally have your students do a poster. We'll ha consider having them do it in DE instead. And as you can see, you have a little preview here. There are task cards that go over the directions on how you or your students can create a poster using Discovery Ed Studio. So you could modify these and give these tasks to your students to create a digital product, or you yourself could follow these to um, create a learning resource for your students. I like searching by project up here at the top. You can see on that page, it has a list of all of the classic elementary projects, um, brochures, making a meme or a postcard. And these are fine to do paper and pencil, but imagine adding a video to your postcard or uh, some audio to your meme. So when you find a project that you're interested in, this is also a really great site to just inspire you for new project ideas, uh, you're going to click on that button. So I chose postcards. And this is set up as the same for no matter what project you choose. You're going to see that as we scroll down the page, we have a matrix. And this looks exactly the same for each one of those projects. It'll tell you at the top, we're looking at the postcard tools. Underneath of that, there is a link to click on, which will give you the directions for each of the platforms below. So we'll click on that in a minute, but for now I wanna draw your attention to the matrix. And you see the first column is paper pencil. So it's always gonna tell you what are some of the benefits of doing paper pencil. But then next to those in blue, we have the applications that we think would be best for creating a postcard digitally that are approved in Anne Arundel County. So we have Google Drawings, Slides, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, and Wixie. Then going um, into our rows here, we have all of the different features of each of these applications. So for example, 
Uh, does this platform support text? Across the board, yes, all of those can support text. Do they support images? Yep, all the way across, every application does. Do they support videos? Well, paper and pencil does not, of course. Uh, in Google Drawing, you can hyperlink a video. You can't make one right in there. In Google Slides, you could embed a video. Uh, same with some of these Microsoft applications. In Wixi, we can embed it right in there because we know as, as we know in Wixi, we can record right from that application. So if you're thinking that you want them to be able to include video clips of themselves, then you may want to choose Wixi or one of these others that allows them to embed or hyperlink. You can see that there are also uh, features like drawing tools. Are there templates available? So um, some of them there are. PowerPoint, there's not a template for postcard. It also gives you some of the save options. I love at the bottom here how we have examples. You see that there is a sample hyperlink for each one of these. Uh, so for Google Drawings, for example, if I wanted to see a sample of that, I would just click on this link. It would open in a new window. This one happens to be sort of an already done postcard for Ottawa, and it has the text boxes and it has the address area. Um, certainly you could use this as an example or you could change or modify it by of course making your own copy under file make a copy. But I also love that besides the sample, there's also resources on how to learn more about those applications. So let's say we've decided we wanna use maybe Wixi or drawings. When we're ready, we're gonna to go to the click here at the top and this will open a new window which uh, leads you to a Google slide deck of each of those applications that was recommended on the matrix. And as you see, as I click down, the format is the same for each one of these. It has the title of postcard and then a dash and the application. So here are the directions for making a postcard in Word. Here are the directions for making a postcard in PowerPoint. Here are the directions for making a postcard in Wixi. Now I love this because as the teacher, you can make a copy of this and edit these directions. So if I wanted to say more specifically for my elementary students, um, at some point after they have the postcard from the library, Maybe I want them to give it the title Anne Arundel County because that's what I want them making a postcard for. So I can customize these because it is a Google file. I can make my own copy. I also like that I can just follow these directions myself and make my own template for students to use and all the directions are right here. So it allows me to find projects that I love and digitize them. I also love at the top of our paper to, paper to digital resource that we have some variations on projects at the top there. So this uh, leads you to some of the classic projects and then some that are similar. So if you're thinking about doing a book report, maybe there's another option here that's a variation on that project, like a character biography or an alternate ending that you could do instead of a book report or as an option for students. So there's lots of ideas here. If I go back to our paper to digital, there's also this uh, tab giving digital feedback. And so if you know that you wanna grade this assignment, this page is going to, again, give you that matrix. This time it's going to show you all the applications where you can give feedback. And across the uh, rows, it's gonna tell you how you give that feedback. Does it allow for numeric grades? Does it allow a peer editor? Um, can you do a two-way discussion? So if you are thinking about doing a, a culminating project that you want to grade, this might be a good place to look, giving feedback digitally. Find an application that has the features you want in terms of grading and giving feedback. And then once you know that application, you can go back to your projects or to that application and you can find which projects you can do. So next we're going to be talking about Nearpod. Now Nearpod is not a new or unique application. We've been using this uh, for a long time in the county and teachers can create gamified interactive presentations that students uh, can do student paced or teacher led in the classroom. There's lots of great uh, interesting activities that you can include within your lesson uh, in Nearpod. But did you know that now students also have accounts for Nearpod so they can create and lead their own Nearpods to show their learning? So I think this is a great culminating activity for them to become the teachers in the classroom. And I used to love in my class to do a project that involved them coming up with some sort of topic that they felt some ownership and some um, real expertise on and then being able to share that with the class. And so instead of making that same old Google slide deck or uh, 
you know, poster board, let's have them try a Nearpod to work on those digital skills as well as to have some excitement. So you can see on the screen here some of the things that Nearpod offers that you can actually embed right within your lesson. And students have all of these same tools. Their interface looks pretty much identical with the exception of having access to some of those shared folders and the Nearpod uh, folder, which is uh, pre-made lessons. So they do have still all the ability to build with all of these different interactives. So how they would get there and how you get there as well is again from class link and go to Nearpod. It's the light blue application. You see it's going to open up in a new window here for me and all of the Nearpods that I've made are going to be right here in this area. Again, you're going to see um, students are not going to have as many of these tabs along the side. They're not going to have uh, the shared libraries and they're not going to have any of these Nearpod folders. So they'll really just have their uh, profiles, their lessons. Once they run a lesson, they will be able to get reports as well. So from Nearpod, they can create using this create button right here. They can create right within Nearpod and they would simply go to creating a lesson. Uh, once they did that, then they're going to be able to add all of their content. So they can add slides and create them right here. They can add an entire slideshow that has already been created um, within a lesson. They can add PDF documents or existing PowerPoints. They can also add images to their slideshows. Uh, you can see here that they can upload those right from their computers, their Google Drive or OneDrive. As you scroll down, you can see that they can add videos. Um, important thing to note is that it does allow them to search in YouTube, which we know we have to be very careful of. It still has all of our filters though. They can also add web content, so it would link to a website. You can see that they have some other interactives here, including brain break videos and even virtual reality field trips. How fun would that be for them to include in the lesson that they create to show their own learning? And as we scroll down, here are sort of the classic ones that we use all the time that I would recommend starting your kids with and showing them how to create these. So maybe you give them a topic or it's after you've finished a unit and they're creating some type of review for their friends in the class. Perhaps they are not only including slides with information, but they're also having students do a little mini multiple choice quiz. Or maybe there's a point where they want to add a draw it activity. You can see right here where that gives them the blank drawing area. So once they are in presentation mode, the students taking the role of the teacher, once they launch the lesson, uh, the students in the class that are following along with them would have this blank slide to be able to draw on. They can also do fill in the blanks. So perhaps they're doing a uh, piece on environmentalism. It is Earth Week, Earth Month, I should say. And maybe they're doing a paragraph that they've written and they're selecting which words they want the students to fill in the blanks. So all of these are pretty uh, self-explanatory as you go through. There's even a section where they can create a collaborative board where everybody in the class or everyone who's in the lesson is working at the same time on the same sort of whiteboard screen. They can do polls. They even have open-ended questions, which is allowing students to do a written response, but it also gives them the um, ability to record audio. So I love this one for our youngest students because they don't even have to write that much. You can just verbally give them the question and they can record. So the way that students would do this if they're working in Nearpod is they would just select which one they wanted to create, maybe this draw it, and then they click on the add button. You see it's going to generate in the background that activity. And here is their editing mode. They would write the question that they want the students to see when they're on the draw it activity and then this is what the students will see when they launch. They could also add images to their question and a timer. So maybe as they're creating their lessons for the class, they only want them to have one minute exactly to complete this draw it. Maybe they're doing a math lesson and they want them to have one minute to draw their manipulatives on their desk, for example. And they also have access to an image library. So this is the same format for no matter uh, what type of activity you add. They press save when they're done with that slide or that element, and then they come back to their main editing area. They can also, of course, change the name of this lesson and continue to edit and move across. We do know, though, that creating in Nearpod, <clears throat> although it's pretty easy and user-friendly, 
we do like the idea of creating in Google Slides and then launching the lesson in Nearpod. So Google Slides speaks with Nearpod in the background. And you're going to see that once in Nearpod, it's going to actually take me to my Google Slides account. And it's going to give me some uh, tutorials here on the front page, same for students. It's going to tell them that they need to install the Nearpod add-on and that that will give them their Nearpod options. So under our extensions, there is the add-on area. So I would go to get add-ons and my students would do the same exact thing. From here, they would just type in or search for Nearpod. And you're going to see it's the first one, Nearpod for Google Slides. I already have it installed, but for something that you didn't have installed, it would give you the option to install it. Then it's going to work its magic. And once it's done under extensions, it's going to show up right here alphabetically. And I'm going to go to open Nearpod. So you can see what happens is once you have that extension downloaded, and yes, your students will have to do that too, but it's really a one-time simple step, then they can launch this anytime they want as they're working in Google Slides, and they can have uh, ready-to-go Nearpods. So you can see over here, I have those same addable options, the Draw It tool, the Bring Break videos, the collaborative board. The layout is just a little bit different. I also have all the same editing tools that I normally do when I'm creating a Google Slides presentation. So maybe my presentation is on cats. I'm just choosing something basic. Um, they put their name. Maybe I want to um, have a draw it next. So I can either go up here into my tools area and click on draw it. And you're going to see that it's giving me that same editor that I had within Nearpod. So maybe I want them to draw a picture. This is of a cat. And I want to add that timer again. I'm going to give them one minute to draw. And remember, I'm a student, so I want it um, to be easy for my class to use. I'm going to press Save. You're going to see that it closes out this window. And I now have a draw it slide within my presentation. If I want to edit this, it's giving me the directions to click on edit this slide, which would allow me to change it. But I'm going to have that same feature. You'll notice I also just deleted that first slide of directions because I don't need it anymore. I already have the extension downloaded. But then think about how fun this would be for students to create. So maybe the next thing I want is a fill in the blank. So I'm going to go to fill in the blank. And I'm doing the same thing that I would do in Nearpod. So in fill in the blanks, you actually type your paragraph maybe they're doing some research based on this they can change the text style and color as you can see here when they're ready they're going to scroll down to the next button and then it tells them, click on the words that you want to add to your word bank. So right now we just have sentences, but I'm going to have the students select some keywords that might be uh, important for this topic to add to my fill in the blanks. And so, I, you know, we could talk about, well, what's how many can you have in the fill in the blank box and which ones would be the best words to use. And once they select those, you'll see that they've become highlighted. And all I've done is I've clicked on it. Now, if I decide I don't want that one, I can just click on the X and I have selected my fill in the blanks. I go to done. You see, it's very intuitive and it pretty much gives directions on what to do every step of the way. And again, I have that fill in the blank. And then maybe after I do these two things, I just want to include some information about cats. So from here, it's just the same it just was filling in that last slide. From here, it's just the same as a regular Google slide, and you can teach them how to add titles and subtitles. They can insert their pictures as usual, um, but they also have all these cool interactive elements. Now, when they're ready to present to the class, they're going to go to Save and go to Nearpod, and you'll see that it's working its magic. <clears throat> here is where that file is, and you'll notice that it's saying almost there, but it's basically creating um, my Google slide into a Nearpod for us to play. So when I'm ready to present as the student, I'm going to go to live participation. I'm going to be able to host this lesson for my class. Now, there are some caveats. A teacher has to join before any other students join. So that's great. They can't just be putting on lessons. Uh, the kids are, that are in the class are just going to type this code into Nearpod 
when they enter Nearpod, they can um, join the lesson. And so you'll see this is what the students will see on their screen, the rest of the class, when they log in. And the students would do their presentation, and everybody in the class would have their Chromebooks out. And when they get to that first slide where they're drawing a cat, then all the students in the class are going to be able to take their tools and draw cats and have a great time. And that timer is going at the top. And then when the student is ready to proceed or they think they've done enough on this slide, as the teacher of the day, they're going to go to their next slide. And here's where my fill in the blank is going to come up. As the teacher, of course, the student is going to be seeing the results of their fill in the blank. Um, since I'm in teacher view now because I've created this one, I'm not seeing the fill in the blank, but my class aka the other students will see it and then of course they'd see all my other slides. So just a really fun way to get students to create a culminating project where they are the teachers and they have some ownership. So Nearpod is awesome. If you haven't tried it yourself it's a great opportunity for you to learn as well um, and for your students to learn right along with you and it just is a unique way to do a presentation. So here's a quick look at what students see uh, when they get into Nearpod. As you can see, it's very similar. They still have the Create button and the Folders button. They just have left, less on the left-hand side. Uh, after they have run a lesson, they would get a report of how their students did that they gave the lesson to. There's also the ability to share with the teacher. So if you wanted to preview their lessons before they actually launch them, you can do that through having them go to the three dots and share it with you as the teacher. This is also the place where if they're not running the lesson and they're just joining a classmate's lesson, this is where they would enter that code that we saw uh, from the teacher view of Nearpod. So I love this idea of making the students become the teacher. So the next app we're going to talk about is WeVideo. Uh, and WeVideo is our video, video editor app. They can also create uh, podcast, screencast, uh, GIFs, and they can do this with the stock media that's already provided or with original material. Um, when the project is finished, they can either export it to Google Drive and then share it that way, like in Brightspace with you. There's also now a WeVideo classroom version where you as the teacher can assign projects for kids to work on. And that's going to be a place where you can monitor them in real time, click into their projects. You can give feedback there on their videos by just simply clicking on the video uh, time track at the bottom. And you can actually even do some collaborative video projects. So if you wanted students to work in partners or in teams, they have that ability to do that. So we're going to jump into WeVideo. So we're going to find WeVideo on our class link page. When we get into WeVideo, both students and teachers will have a classroom version and a classic version. So we're going to actually start in classic because there are some templates in here that I think are really great that are not available in classroom. So if you've never been in WeVideo before, this is what the platform looks like for you and for students. You're going to see along the left hand side, this is where we can create new uh, products and students can create videos. Uh, recordings that would be recordings of their voice or their screen or both. They can create GIFs which are those short little videos that play over and over and they can even record podcasts so that would be audio. Uh, most of the time students are working in the video editor and you have two versions a simplified editor which looks like this as you see it's really just adding um, pictures and simple audio or music and then there is also the full featured editor, which is the one I actually think for me is a bit easier because you see it has these three tracks down here at the bottom where students can add text, videos or images as well as audio and they kind of have separate areas for uh, where you put those things. So if you are making a video, which is one of the cool ideas I think uh, would be fun in a unique project for the end of the year, like a culminating uh, project for students to work on, you'll see that once you're in there, it has you opened up to your My Media. Now, if you have never added media, you won't have anything in here, but the students also have access to um, media libraries. So underneath of that we have video libraries and as you can see it's searchable. So if you don't have anything in your My Media it's because you haven't uploaded anything to your media gallery or you haven't recorded anything. So you'll see that you can import and here you can import 
uh, media from your Google Drive or your OneDrive account. You can also import right from your computer as well. Record is where you can actually record yourself on your webcam. So imagine students recording themselves talking about something. This would be great as even just an exit ticket at the end of class. They can record their screen, which would be, of course, whatever's going on on their um, Chromebook. So maybe they're using an online manipulative for math. You could have them record their screen and show how they solved the math problem. They can also do the screen and the webcam. So you would see what they're working on on their screen as well as in the corner a picture of or a video of them. So that's how they can create media in their media library if they don't have anything already. There's also the narrate button which will allow them to record audio. But if they don't have anything and they want to use whatever stock images and videos they have, they have a full media library. So it's searchable right up here and you see it's categorized things like food and beverage, animals, and it tells them how long those videos are. Once they find something that they like, they're simply going to drag it down to that video uh, track. And it, you can see that by default, this is about a 15 second video. Then you can have them work on cutting and clipping videos and you can um, have them work on kind of piecing what they want together. There's also an image gallery. So if they just want a uh, still image, they can get that too. And again, you can talk about how with images, you can make them as long as you want. There's also a uh, tons of audio that they can play and listen to. This one's called Epic. I love this one. And you can talk about how, wow, this audio track is super long. Let's use our playhead here and go to the end of where our video ends and let's split that track and delete the part that we don't need. So I'm not going to go through a full tutorial of WeVideo, but if you've never used it before, it really is pretty intuitive. There's also text. So text is awesome because it will overlay on top of your video videos and images. So I can move this text box around and maybe it's as simple as the students are just talking about their favorite animal or a memory they have of this year. And they're just using some titles and some captions um, and other types of text on top of layering their videos. They also have some transitions that they can do, transitioning from one image to the next, um, some different backgrounds that are pretty fun, and some extras. So this alone is a great lesson for a day, and then using it to create student products I think is really awesome. So that's if you're building from scratch. If you have an idea already that normally you have them do a, you know, book report, maybe they do a video book report and they're showing different symbols and things that the characters are going through and you have your whole rubric, but instead of doing it on paper, they're doing it right here in WeVideo. I'm back to our main page here and instead of going to create new, students and teachers also have the templates uh, kind of folder over here. So I'm clicking on the left hand side. You see across the top there are some categories. I love the templates because it pretty much gives a framework for what students need to include. So for example, think about how fun it would be to when you're studying vocabulary, any vocabulary, to use a Freyer model as a video. So to use a template you just literally click on it. Your students will do the same thing. You see that it already has the text, the definitions, the examples, and if I scroll down on my track here, it has the non-example and the audio with it. So it's all playing at the same time. So of course, students are going to pick their word and all they have to do is click on that track and change it to their word. They're double clicking and then changing it to whatever vocabulary word they're working on. Clicking on done, then they go to the next one. What's the definition? Well, then they're double clicking here and they're writing in the definition blah, 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 for today's purposes. I'm just going to put in some random text, but you see it's automatically changing that. Then they're going to the next one. What's an example? And so they're double clicking on that example uh, box. And you see right here that there is the text that says example, but that's actually an image. So I'm going to go ahead and say I'm done with this. The example is an image. So I want to go up here to images and I want to find an image of the environment because that's what my word is. So I'm searching, oh, I love this image. So I'm gonna teach my students, okay, I'm gonna delete this example, and instead I'm going to pull down this image that I like better, 
and I'm going to drag it across for the full length of the video. And oh no, it doesn't fit properly. So I'm going to click on that and I'm going to fit it to scale. So I'm going to move it where I want to move it and notice that I have those little adjusters. And so I'm going to make it so that it fits in the spot I want it to fit in. And when I like it, I'm going to say done. And so as you can see, it may not be perfect. It's going to take some time for students to learn, but what a great way for them to get into content and to uh, really make something their own. They're still showing their learning, but it's in such a different way. And they're learning those valuable tech skills as well. So again, to get to any of those templates, I'm just on my main page. Students have the same layout. They're going to templates and you'll see there's a ton of them all already here. I love this idea of them creating a morning meeting plan. Again, it's already there for them. Let's click on that one so you can see. Uh, this one has different elements of the track and I usually recommend having them play the video in this preview so they can see what it looks like and then they can go through and make edits. So the other option that students have when they get into WeVideo, and I'm actually going to close out and go back to WeVideo for this, is that you as a teacher can assign them something in their classroom. So we were working in Classic, but you can also assign things to them in the classroom um, version. So for me as a teacher, I would go to create a new class. I'm going to name the class. I'm going to go to these three dots. I'm going to go to edit. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to click on the class. Um, it automatically has a first assignment in there called introduce yourself. I think this is a really great way to start your students in we video. Um, and since typically we have a little bit of extra time at the end of the year, this is a great thing to do um, at the end of the year so they can play around in we video before you actually give them an assignment. But anyways, up here on the tab next to assignments are people. And this is how your students can join. There is a little code right here, the invite code. So when students go into classroom, they're going to have um, the code. Let me show you back here. They're going to be able to go to join class and put your code in and then they will populate into your classroom here. Uh, if you don't like the introduce yourself video because it's too late in the year or you already have a project in mind, you're going to just go to create an assignment. And maybe your assignment is on um, electricity. So you write your description here of what you want the students to do. Uh, you know, create a two minute video on everything we learned about electricity. Be sure to include blah, 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 all, this, all the great stuff that you did in class. So this project type, I want it to be a video, but you could also make it a GIF or a podcast. You can see right here, I can make it a team project. What happens if I make it a team project is I calculate how many teams I want, and then the students actually self-enroll into those groups. I do have the ability to move them around. I will say that the more students you add into a video project, the more complicated it gets. So I would recommend you start first with an individual project. You see that you can add a due date here. You can also import a cover photo. So if you want there to be a photo that students see as they, let's use this one of our uh, terrapins. <laughs> if you want them to see a little photo as they click onto this assignment, that's where you can put that cover photo. The other awesome thing as I scroll down here is that if I wanted to give students specific content that we've covered in class, for example, if I had specific um, pictures or di diagrams that I wanted them to be able to include that I knew would not be in the video, I can add that in a media bin. So it tells you students are going to see this media in their media bin and they'll also have access to the full stock library. So here is where I can add media for this project. So I can go into my computer or my drive and I can fill this up with images and uh, videos and audio. And maybe it's only one or two images. Maybe you're doing um, a book character video and you just want to put in a couple pictures of that book cover and the character because you know it's not going to be in there. So once it's all set up and you have your media bin, you're going to go to save draft or publish. In this case, I'm finished, so I'm going to go to publish. You see there's my little diagram that does not match the title, but that's okay. I'm going to be able to see as the teacher who's turned it in and who's 
uh, working on it. When I go to review progress, I'm going to see all my students here once they've joined with the code. And that's a way that I can go in and check on their progress. I can't do that when they're working in templates, but templates are not available in classrooms. So you have to kind of decide which version or which elements that you want. But WeVideo is awesome. Kids are always super engaged. And we know that they are the social media generation. So I'm sure they're going to love it. So the next thing I want to show you is Adobe Express. This is one of our, this is our newest app, I should say. It's on class link as this rainbow colored A, and it does a lot of great things. So finding it on class link, for me, it's up at the top. When you get in, you're going to see a menu over here. The plus sign is where you can create new, new projects. So I want to quickly show you the quick actions you're able to do. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just so you know, you're able to trim videos in here. So if you have downloaded a video or you have uh, taped something yourself and you want to trim it, you can do that right in Adobe. You can resize videos, you can merge videos together, um, change the speed of videos. You can also use this to uh, modify your PDFs. So you can convert images and text and things to PDF, but you can also edit PDFs in here uh, and combine files into PDFs. So things that we weren't able to do before, PDFs are usually kind of locked. You actually have a lot of ability to manipulate your existing PDFs. You also can do a lot with images, like you can remove the backgrounds. I love this for if you're taking pictures of students for some type of project and you just want them, you don't want a lot of background, you can very easily remove background. It's literally as simple as uh, selecting your image. You click on remove background and you'll see within a few seconds, it literally takes your image background away completely. Um, you can do the same type of image edits that you would do in some other applications like crop it and resize it, but you can also convert it to different methods. So these are just some of the quick actions that you're able to do in Adobe, but we're kind of focusing on our projects and our unique projects for students. So students also have access to Adobe Express to do all of this great stuff. I love the idea of creating a collage an explainer video, these are awesome. So an explainer video is literally exactly that. It's when kids explain something. Maybe you're doing a unit on fractions. They put in the title. Then they get to pick a template here. Um, teach a lesson is the one that I usually choose because the students are explaining something. So it's gonna give you a quote as it works, it's magic, but it literally has templated what look like slides, but when put together, it creates a video. And you'll see that it's a very streamlined uh, video editor. They have just a few simple layouts. They have the ability to add text. They have the ability to add audio right here. They can change the time that this slide is um, working is, excuse me, displayed on the screen. So maybe they want this title slide for three seconds and they want to say, hey, everybody, we're working on fractions. Okay, press here while you're speaking. Hey, everybody, we're going to be working on fractions. I hope you enjoy it. So now it is recorded. I can see because it has that text here. I can also change the layout. You see, as I click over here on the right, I could add an image and it does have an image library here. I can also upload from my drive or anything else. So I'm going to search fractions and see what they have here. Well, this is a great image. So I click on that. It adds it right in. I can readjust it. I can edit this image. Then I can go to the next one. You see it steps them through. So there was a title slide. The next is the concept. So describe what you're teaching. So again, they're able to use videos or text. Again, video is going to um, take them to their files, so they may not have that, but they can add what it is. Fractions are parts of a whole, and then they can talk about that there by recording their audio, and they're talking about fractions. They can also uh, remove that narration and change the length of that image on the screen. Maybe they want it uh, as a caption. So I'm changing my layout here and adding a photo. You can see up here at the top, I can even also add music. So I have different types of music, uplifting. And then up at the top, my voice and 
and it is super simple. They're literally just filling in. So I love explainer video. I think that's an awesome project. Um, they also have the ability to create web pages, students, from Adobe. And it's a very simple web page, but it's still pretty awesome. So it's a different alternative to uh, video. You're literally just adding with the plus button at the bottom. And across the top, you have some options here, including a theme. So maybe I want this to be a storybook theme. So you see it changes my font a little bit. Or as I scroll down, you know what? I really want this to be a little more vintage looking. So it's changing my font and, and things like that. So now I'm going to add something. Do I want a photo? Do I want a split layout here? Um, so just in using these little plus signs, I'm able to do a lot very intuitively. Again, just picking pictures that I like. On this side, I'm also going to uh, maybe include definition. Maybe I'm then going to include um, a button of some sort that takes them to a website. Click here. Maybe this takes them to a Google slide that they've created. So I'm actually just going to steal the link that I have to my presentation here and put that in. But, you know, they can actually absolutely um, link to other things. I'm going to press save. Now there's a click here, hyperactive, hyperlinked button. You can see that there's different splits in the screen where I can then create new sections. So I would like to now do a photo grid and it's going to be all fraction pictures. So saying add pictures and as you see as I continue adding pictures it's making the grid for me so all of these are claiming to be fraction pictures I can rearrange them if I'd like but I like how it does a lot of the work for me already I'm going to press save and while I haven't added too much I think you get the idea and I'm going to go to either present or preview I like to see it in preview mode it's going to give the students a little look at their website and you can see that it feels like they did a really professional job and that was what maybe two minutes um, they even include the credits of everything that you've included from their media library which i think is really nice so this is again just a great way for them to maybe um, summarize a book or some sort of event in history in a web oops i love the idea of um, having this project and being able to come back to it so maybe they are creating a website at the beginning of a new unit and every day as an exit ticket they're adding to this web page something that they learned that day an image and some text that represents what they are learning so lots of great things in adobe i just showed you two there are also uh, ways for them to make social media posts. It gives the exact dimensions for Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, um, a really fun application. The last one I want to talk about today, Minecraft, this is the education version. So it's going to do all the things that the game does, but it has the ability for teachers to turn off all the violent pieces of it. And it also, um, has a lot of built-in features and holds that you can learn in and a lot of them are pre-made as well so we're going to launch into minecraft it is game-based learning they are doing some coding it's a lot of math and problem solving it's a lot of um, manipulating using your mouse and keyboard so things they can pretty much work on this independently. I think every kid I know has been in Minecraft at least once, but even if they haven't, it's very laid out in terms of there's tutorials for how to use it. Um, it's also, it's not just free building, it can be structured and you can structure it so that they're all working in their own independent area. I do want to say, shameless plug, that we have a new self-paced course in Unified Talent for Minecraft. It is a six hour course. You do get credits for that, APC credits. Um, it takes you through all of what you need to know for Minecraft. I also want to show you our help resource because so from our class links page, you're going to go to the big T teacher intro to digital tools. That's going to take you to our help site and across the top, you're going to go to application support. And as you scroll down, you should see alphabetically Minecraft education. So this page has really everything you need to know. Um, so it's starting at the top. It tells you that you, ha you actually have to install education. Um, teachers have to install it and students have to install it. Good news is most students in elementary have already figured out how to do that. So the first page here is how you as the teacher would install on your laptop or your desktop computer. 
And then the second page is how students would access Minecraft education from their Play Store. And it's really simple. They just have to install it. Once they've installed it once, they have it there. You can even print out these directions if you'd like. But once you have it on your computer, you're going to be accessing it from your Start button just like you would any other program. And I'll show you um, how it looks when you get in. Here's our Minecraft for Education. It's going to load here and it's going to give you some options once you're in. Same with the students. It will connect with your AACPS account. Um, as a teacher, I always like to check out the new and featured. They always have a fully curated lesson where students can walk around and read um, the bulletin boards that teach them things and they can uh, talk to experts. This one happens to be on a rocket launch and then they actually build a rocket launch. But I'm going to go to play for now. And in play, I have an area where I can create a new world, which a lot of students do. I can join someone else's world. Um, if you're working with your students for the first time, have them all create a new world and just sort of play around. You can also go to your existing worlds here. This is one of the options I'm going to show you on our teacher uh, help page. It's the individual build areas. So again, you can see you can host or play. For now, I'm going to go just play so you can see what it looks like. But we have created some worlds that already have um, spaces where students can build. So if you see here, I'm looking at these sort of huge building areas that have those red perimeter lines. And that's because this is where students are going to be able to um, build in their own building space. There's a little <laughs> uh, animal of some sort. So they each get a little building area and you can see that they are unable to go into other people's build zones. The way that they get into one of these build areas is that when they enter this uh, world, you can see that they would walk up to one of the rooms, they would add their name here, and they click on this gray button, which will import them to their workspace. And they can come um, into that place to work anytime. Once they've reserved a room, that one's taken. You can see the instructions are right here on the board for them to read as they navigate through. You can edit those, of course, and then it will, again, like I said, it will fly them to their build space where they can do their work there. Now I'll show you on our page where you can get a world like that so everyone can build in their own area, but there's also the library which is filled with awesome pre-made worlds and activities. I'm in the subject kits right now and you can see they have every subject you can think of and all these really elaborate fun worlds. I'm going to go to the social emotional subject kit and you can see that they have um, worlds that are already made that teach students concepts. So the kids would come into these worlds and they would navigate and talk to the different uh, people and read the bulletin boards. And sometimes there's even a challenge that they build that's based on uh, one of these concepts. So for example, Empathy Village, um, a celebration. And so it's teaching them some of those concepts in a very gamified format which they will of course love. And I like that you can use these on the fly. I also wanna point out um, in the library, you have the how to play tutorials. This is where I would recommend you as the teacher start as well as your students. Um, and there's the starting here for the keyboard version or the touch version. So as you see here, the icon of the mouse and the keyboard versus the, versus the touch screen, the tutorials are going to be different. Uh, students, as we know, have touch screens, so you could participate in this tutorial. I always recommend using a mouse. I think it's a lot easier to navigate for kids if you have them. But e either way, it's going to take you through these six lessons that teach them how to move, how to place and break break blocks, how to interact with things in the world, um, using the camera, and, and understanding chalkboards. So these are the tutorials we definitely recommend that you do and that you work with your kids on as well. So I'm going to close out of Minecraft and go to our help page. Um, so that you can see what's there. So here are our, right underneath of the installing directions, are the two worlds that have the individual build areas so that you as the teacher can see everybody building at the same time, but they can't disrupt each other. So have down here some of our rationale about why Minecraft education, what you can do with it. Um, what I also love is this one right here, our no prep 
low prep Minecraft ideas. Uh, we have compiled ideas for each subject area and what you can do on the fly with very little prep. So you could say, okay, boys and girls, I want you to go into Minecraft and we've been talking about shapes and polygons. I want you to create an irregular polygon. Go ahead and build that. You have two minutes and they're all building in Minecraft. Um, so it's just another blank canvas, but a different way to show what they've learned. And they can also use text through those bulletin boards. Um, in reading and language arts, they could create a timeline using the blocks and the boards to do a chronological ordering of events. They can even just do something basic. Our little guys, they can just be building words and, and um, letters using those blocks. We even had a kindergarten teacher who used Minecraft to have students just stack blocks, make a, make a block set that shows 14, a set of 10 and four more blocks. You could show them um, how to create landforms using the blocks, or they could create their own city or town. So the ideas are really almost endless. We also have on this page some of the um, tutorials in video format. If you're not actually in Minecraft, you can watch the videos to get some tutorials. The setting and customizations area is really great for you to see some of the recommended settings for when you're hosting as the teacher. It's going to give you some of those tips like turning off friendly fire um, and some of the things you want to look out for so that kids aren't destroying the world. And then finally at the very bottom, we have examples from AACPS, how people have been using um, Minecraft. Here's that kindergarten numbers project, uh, another kindergarten class using honey, doing a honeybee project where they're writing, um, creating pollinator gardens for their bees. Th this project was where students were creating bridges, um, designing tree houses. So it's a lot of really fun and engaging activities and inspirational ideas. So now that we've gone through all of that, I do want to give you some of our help resources for these great ideas that we've talked about today. So the first one is this Teacher Intro to Digital Tools page. Again, I'll show you. You get there by going to the big T on ClassLink, and it's going to take you to our Teacher Intro to Digital Tools page. Our application support button is going to give you support on everything that I talked to you about today. I'm going to just scroll down to Nearpod, for example. If you want to go back and get more information, this is where you will come to get tutorials, uh, video support, printables, as well as resource links. This kind of has everything that you need to know for all of our applications. I also want to remind you that every school has an in-house resource, which is your e-coach. Um, and you also can talk to your Brightspace champions about how to do some of these projects and get them into Brightspace. And finally, please reach out to me, Samantha Wilkinson, or my partner in crime, Carrie Lambert, who are both elementary teacher specialists. We'd love to talk you through some of these projects. I hope you feel inspired and let us know if you try something new at the end of the year. Thanks for watching.